Hi friends, Angelica Veneta, co-chair of Inclusive ICR. We are a coalition of over 220 employers in Eastern Iowa, all working together to grow the diversity and inclusion of our workforce, to create a space where employees feel a sense of belonging, included, and valued. Inclusive ICR is a proud sponsor of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion track of the Iowa Ideas Conference. As you participate today, be sure to connect with other Inclusive ICR champions, as we'd love to share information with you about our upcoming coalition meetings, projects, and how our work is impacting positive social change in our region. Be sure to check out our website at inclusiveicr.org for upcoming events and our e-newsletter. Thank you and have a great conference. Good afternoon and welcome to Iowa Ideas 2021. As much as we'd like to be face to face with you, over the past 18 months, we've learned that virtual engagement can be rewarding and you don't need socks, shoes, or pants. Um, <laughs> this session is uh, titled, Why is Compromise So Hard to Find? And you wouldn't believe how long it took to get agreement on that. I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine that you'll have any questions for this panel, but in case you do, please submit them through the Whova app and we'll get to as many questions as time permits. This, sponsor, this session is being sponsored by Inclusive ICR Iowa. Here's a word from our sponsor. Hi friends, Angelica Veneta, co-chair of Inclusive ICR. We are a coalition of over 220 employers in Eastern Iowa, all working together to grow the diversity and inclusion of our workforce, to create a space where employees feel a sense of belonging, included, and valued. Inclusive ICR is a proud sponsor of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion track of the Iowa Ideas Conference. As you participate today, be sure to connect with other Inclusive ICR champions, as we'd love to share information with you about our upcoming coalition meetings, projects, and how our work is impacting positive social change in our region. Be sure to check out our website at inclusiveicr.org for upcoming events and our e-newsletter. Thank you and have a great conference. And, and thank you to Inclusive ICR. Although it makes me feel old to say this, back at the turn of the century when I started covering the Iowa legislature, I would hear people say, better a half a loaf than nothing. I don't seem to hear that as much anymore. Some people, it seems, want the whole loaf uh, without leaving any anything for the other party. Uh, some people, it seems, are willing to accept nothing rather than get only a crumb. Everyone talks a good compromise game. Majorities and minorities talk about the need to compromise, about their willingness to reach across the political aisle to get things done. But behind the red rhetoric, current attitudes toward compromise may have been best summed up in a recent post at The Onion, uh, the satire news site, which attributed to a member of Congress the philosophy that the key to compromise is demanding that you get everything you want while giving up nothing in return. True or false? We'll find out as we talk about comp why compromise is so hard to find, or is it right in front of us if only we look for it? And to help us answer that question, we have with us retired U.S. Congressman Dave Loebsack of Mount Vernon, former Speaker of the Iowa House Linda Upmeyer of Clear Lake, Steve Sovereign, an attorney, mediator, and former legislator from Cedar Rapids, and former Iowa Senate President, former <coughs> County Supervisor, and retired attorney Annie McKean of Anamosa. Dave, you, you spent 14 years in the Iowa, in, in the U.S. House, in, in the majority and in the minority. How accurate is the Onion's definition of compromise? Uh, well, thanks for having me on first, James, and thanks to all the sponsors. Uh, it's a great conference. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, I really like The Onion uh, because I think The Onion often is right on the mark in terms of uh, uh, its satire, but it's often quite true as well. And I recommend The Onion to anybody who wants to, to read that sort of thing and get a kick out of it. Um, it is a lot of fun. Um, look, whenever you go into some kind of a negotiation, you don't want to give anything up. I mean, that's just normal human behavior. You think you have a great idea, and the last thing you want to do is give anything up. And I think uh, other folks uh, on this call or on this video um, who've been in office pro probably would agree with that to begin with. 
but you know that you have to. Um, and hopefully when you go into a negotiation or you present an idea, you've got some kind of plan B or plan C or whatever the case may be, um, because you're just simply not going to get the full loaf unless somehow you have such a great idea uh, that there's unanimous support for it. That doesn't happen very often. And even if you have near unanimity in the U.S. Senate, there's a chance, a great chance that one person is going to stop it and then you're going to be in big trouble. But I think there's a lot to be said for that saying, but that then leaves, I think, open uh, the possibility to, uh, to really to negotiate if you go in knowing that you're not going to get everything you want to get. Linda, uh, you, you know, your experience in the Iowa House, um, and, I, and I believe you've been in both the minority and the majority, or, or, and so you've seen this from both sides. A lot of times I hear people talking about compromise and they say they merely restate their position over and over as if they're saying, you know, if, if you would only move my direction, we could reach an agreement. And is that just a bargaining strategy or, or is that how legislators look at compromise? I'll stand here until you come over to my side. You know, I'm not sure it's precisely either one of those two things, but uh, just to kind of frame it up. First of all, I, I, I think we should remember that between 80 and 90% of the legislation that does move through is on a bipartisan basis and does involve compromise. Certainly the very high profile, the, the things we read about in the press most often are the ones that don't achieve that goal. Um, the other thing that I, that I think we need to remember as we talk about compromise is I, uh, in my past experience, I've always felt like relationships are key to that. When you know someone, when you um, uh, have worked with them, have you, you, you know, you've maybe gotten to know them on a social level in some way, but you have a relationship. I think back to, uh, you know, we all, all used to do forums in person in our communities. And uh, every time I did those, I did them with a member of the opposing party. So Senator Reagan and I did have done forums for the entire time I was in the legislature. Over those years, Obviously, we we did build a relationship. We I, I attended her son's wedding. We have disagreed. We have agreed. We have listened to our constituents, and we've been able to find many many places to work together. So I think thinking about those relationships are important. The thing I've seen change lately that's really affected compromise, and and um, I know we hear this far too often, but honestly, it's social media and. Um, the fact that we lose that relationship building, that face-to-face -face opportunity for dialogue when people are simply responding or when someone puts out a position or a thought or an idea only to be met with a lot of criticism and really vitriol. It's not, you know, oh, well, here's another opinion. It's really uh, much more uh, perhaps hard hitting than that. And that has a very chilling effect and I just don't think it, it lends itself well to, to compromise. So I think the, uh, as, as, as the more we can build uh, those relationships, I think that has was, is what has moved uh, the needle. I think back to the times when uh, Senator Gronstall was in charge of the Senate and I, I was in charge of the House. We had to find compromise. You can't adjourn session without that. So we found many opportunities to do that. At the same time, there were always... Um, things that the members had campaigned on, they had door knocked on, they had heard from their constituents and got elected because of their position perhaps, and were not very willing to move on those kinds of topics. So um, I, I think those were the positions they were willing to fight for. And I, that's certainly what I've seen in my experience. Okay. Steve, when we talked earlier, you said that as a mediator, when people came to you, they were looking for a solution. So they were open to compromise. And, and is that the key that the parties have to be open to compromise um, before they can compromise? They have to accept that they're not going to get everything they want and, and they're going to have to meet somewhere in the middle. Maybe. <laughs> and and uh, it's a great question. Let me first say, uh, having listened to David and listened to Linda and recognizing that whether I like it or not, I bring a historical perspective to this room. But 
the history includes, uh, Linda, your dad. Yes. Uh, I went into the Senate uh, uh, when Del Stromer was a power in the House. I, I like the man. Uh, we worked together uh, in education funding, and I remember he was seen as the person all of us went to when it came to this complicated formula. Uh, and there were other, that's when Bob Ray was governor, Art New was lieutenant governor. Those were the halcyon days of legislative cooperation. Now, with regard to your question too, uh, James, um, you know, people don't come into a room wanting compromise. As a matter of fact, uh, it's kind of a nasty word sometimes because it connotes uh, giving up principles. It connotes concessions. Uh, and in this day and age, of course, it's a real challenge. But further, I would say that there are, in the room, there are, there are two different considerations when it comes to working together. Uh, in the room, it's about the skills uh, and the interests. And that's what people, you hope people are starting to talk about their interests, what their shared interests are and what have you. But the other, uh, and I think uh, a force that has grown in strength uh, astronomically in the last 50, 40 years of politics is the pressures from outside that prevent the collaboration inside. And that simply said is that um, uh, uh, I believe that uh, unwittingly or maybe wittingly, we have empowered those forces that fight against compromise. They're set on interest groups that have one particular crowbar they want to stick into the forum of democracy and have their way. And because they have grown in power by means of money, uh, uh, organization and what have you, that uh, we find ourselves in the room really looking over our shoulder to those out of the room because it means our longevity or lack thereof of being in the room. I, I want to follow up on that with you, Linda. Um, as speaker, you had a steady parade of people coming to your office asking for one thing or another. Were they asking or were they telling you what you needed to do to have their continued support? Were they asking or telling? Well, you, you know, I, Steve, I really appreciate the, those comments. It really has caused me to think back over that very question, James, uh, it, nine times out of 10, they were asking, it, you know, really when people come into the office, they, and, and they have a conversation with the speaker, the leadership, the committee chairs, those, those folks, they really want to plead their case. They want you to understand their issue. So much of the time I was listening to that, seeing uh, if that sort of jived with where the caucus was, what people were talking about, the, the committee was talking about, um, uh, and, it, and if it did not, I was very quick to let them know that that, that was certainly not what people were hearing at home. Uh, because that's what we always go back to is what people are hearing at home. What, what are your neighbors telling you? What are the people that sent you here to represent them telling you? So sometimes that was a real conflict. Sometimes there was a place for compromise. Uh, I, I, I can tell you during my time as speaker and even as leader, um, there were very, very few uh, people that came in with with sort of demands like uh, sort of the uh, not not the term you use necessarily, but sort of the threat of withholding support if in fact um, you didn't do exactly what they wanted you to do. And truly, as as a speaker, I I, I didn't believe that there was any one group of people that were the core of our success. So following what constituents expected of us and doing what we said we'd do when we got elected, in my opinion, was the, the key to, to being successful and doing the right thing for Iowans. So I, I didn't experience that. I'm not, I'm not saying that doesn't exist in, in some places, but I, I really didn't experience much of that. Certainly I knew what folks were hoping for, 
And sometimes that coincided with what Iowans uh, were hoping for, but certainly not always. And, and, and so often those things did not get accomplished that, um, that someone might be wishing for. But I really, I, I really felt like listening was uh, the key to compromise. There were opportunities to compromise as we, as we worked through some of those issues. Hey, James, do you mind if I jump in on that? Sure, go second? ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, all rank and file members, you know, had folks coming in, whether it's a state house or, or at the congressional level. Linda came in to see me with the group at one point, a couple of times, I think. And, um, uh, you know, the, the idea that you'd be threatened, I thought, was, when I was there, would be quite ludicrous. Uh, I had a couple of people, you know, a couple of times say, oh, you're not going to get support. And, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't laugh or something. Uh, I didn't disrespect them, but, um, but uh, basically I said, well, you know, you have to make your decision wherever that's going to be. And I have to make my decision wherever that's going to be. And, and you go from there, but the vast majority, as Linda said, overwhelming majority of people came in and, and they, they did, they plead, they pled their case. They tried to make their points and they asked for your support. Um, uh, you know, look, it's a, uh, it's a tough game. Sometimes there's no question about that. But you, know, you just have to be able to stand up to the bullies, and and that's the bottom line. And and I guess have enough faith in your own decision making that you're going to do the right thing. You're going to do the right thing for your constituents. And and if a, a group or two groups or whatever is is upset about it, the the worst probably that can happen is they'll put up a primary challenge against you or some mm -hmm. something of that sort. Uh, but even then, you know, if if you feel good about how you're representing people, yeah, you'll think about that. But that's not going to determine what you do for sure. So when voters look at Congress or look at the legislature and say they're not willing to compromise, is, is the, the unwillingness to compromise coming from the base of the party or is it coming from the top of the party? Um, I, I mean, Linda, you talked about, you know, 80 percent of the legislation is, is bipartisan and passes with bipartisan support. But those issues that you, you're going to stand firm on, where does that um, sort of direction come from? It, um, are the, is the base telling you don't give an inch or is that sort of a party and a party leadership decision saying we're not going to budge? Well, in my experience, uh, while I was speaker, that, that, that sort of came from a caucus, which came from home. So, when when they were getting phone calls, emails, uh, uh you know, input to, um, the, Whatever, whatever tough issue it was for a position, for, for them to be in a certain position, um, they felt support from home to be in that position. And uh, there was often little I could do to, to, to budge them from that. Uh, that being said, uh, and I think this is true of both caucuses, both parties, there was very lively debate within the caucus about different topics and the directions we might be able to go uh, in, in in some of those as some of those top issues that that we would debate, um, but but I really felt like it, it was more uh, it was a home based granular. I, I I didn't feel pressure from the top. Certainly when uh, when a governor had a priority or there was a priority from the Senate, it got full debate, and we uh, worked to find a way to support what they uh, were doing, and that was true. I can remember back when uh, when Governor Vilsack was governor, we were in the majority. When he had priorities, we tried to find a way to help with those priorities. I, you know, this is government for Iowans, so we find try and find a path. And I'm sure he didn't get the bill precisely as he wanted it necessarily, but it got done and uh, got to his desk so he could sign it. So I, so I. I I don't. I don't. I don't feel like it comes from the top down. I really feel like the at the grassroots level. I was a a state of, of real grassroots, and I think what what people here at home really drives what they do when they when they show up in Des Moines. Can I jump in, James? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, because I I really appreciate you touched on some important things, Linda. Uh, and it may not from, be from the top down, but too often it's from the rotunda in. Now, what do I mean by that? I, I mean that there's a, there's a big difference uh, when you're hearing the wants and needs of an individual constituent 
and you're listening to the wants and needs of, uh, let's say, a lobbyist who represents roads. I don't pick your interest. When you're talking to a constituent, they come in with, uh, they may want better roads, but not at the expense of better schools or not at the expense of the health care of their uh, elders. Uh, and uh, so you listen to those and then, and then in comes the, the lobbyist for, let's say, the road groups. Uh, first of all, they generally uh, have, uh, maybe this is, um, they have a check in their pocket or they have had somewhere along the line, which it may not influence the legislator's vote, but it certainly will allow them in the door more often than not. The other part of it is that they don't come with that panoply of interests, balancing in their own mind, uh, you know, if Linda or David were to say, well, what about healthcare for my uh, grandparents or something? And, and the person who is representing roads, well, they've got to take care of themselves, but you know, I'm here to represent roads and that's, that's really the key issue. And that's really why we support you because uh, roads are more important uh, than anything for us. So uh, that makes the voice more powerful, uh, unfortunately, and one at least that you have to fight against to be have the earphones on for, for the citizens as opposed to the pressure groups. Linda? I, I have to say, I, I have not had um, quite that experience. Certainly, first of all, um, everybody got in my door, and I think that's true for most leadership. I was, I was not that big a state. There's a, it, we, we have time. We have lots of opportunity. And um, I think it, James, even the press, had uh, lots of access to the speaker. But um, So I, I think we do listen to everyone. I don't think um, uh, big dollar has a difference. Uh, certainly timing has a difference. If we're talking about a roads bill, I want uh, and, and road builders and, and whether they're local ones or or um, someone that uh, is a representing an association, certainly those people I want to hear from while we're talking about roads, as opposed to when we're talking about something else. So timing may it may be different, but I I, I think most leadership uh, majority minority uh, have a pretty open door policy. And again, I think it goes back to. It, it, what Dave said earlier, you know, happy to listen, happy to listen to the perspective, but at the end of the day, there's no one entity that if, if, if they don't want to support what the members are hearing at home, um, frankly, those people don't vote for us. Though, so people in the legislature are much more inclined to represent their, their constituency than, uh, uh, than a lobbyist walking in, the, in their door. We do look to lobbyists for information. We test that information uh, against what we, what we know from others and, and from what we know from those local businesses at home that we can reach out to. But I, but I, I, I really, certainly they're present, uh, they're, they're in the rotunda, but I think people's perception of their outsized influence is, is largely perception that um, they, they, they don't have uh, nearly as much influence as perhaps they hope they do on, on uh, most days. And, uh, and, and the members, they're, they're getting email from home. I think it's a, a phone calls, emails. Uh, you know, I've heard legislators, and I will paraphrase this incorrectly, but you get three phone calls from home. I remember Mary Lundy saying this often. You get three phone calls from home and you know you got a problem. You get seven and you've got a crisis. And so people are, uh, again, we represent 30,000 people. We are motivated legislators. I, and I should say we. I can only speak for myself. But I was always motivated. And I observed members being motivated by what they were hearing at home. And so certainly lobbyists are there. Certainly they do their job. Um, but, but at the end of the day, sometimes uh, they are on, uh, they're on the side of the, where the bill is going to go. And sometimes they're not. So. Um, 
Yeah, and I'd like to just say, if I could, James, jump in here. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, my internet connection was kind of slow earlier there. Um, look, you know, in the case of a member of Congress from Iowa, uh, until the redistricting, you know, I represented 765, 780,000 people. And there are a lot of different groups on all sides of the issue. My main uh, rule of thumb at the outset was basically don't let anybody in that door to see me unless they have something to do with my congressional district, first and foremost, because you know, there are a lot of people who want to see a member of Congress, just like there are at the state level as well. Uh, a lot of national issues at stake, and people want to come in and talk to you about that. And that may or may not have an effect on your district. But then, you know, we had people come in all the time on all different sides of all different issues. Um, but the fact of the matter is, and this is something where I often joke, Steve King and I actually agreed on something, and that is the lobbyists serve a function, and they do. They represent people. They represent sometimes tens of thousands, if not millions of people in this country, depending upon the group that, that they're representing. So it, there's nothing inherently evil about lobbyists and about lobbying. And that's what I would tell students, uh, for example, when I visit schools or colleges, if you want to have influence, maybe one of the best ways you'd have influence is join an organization of some sort that will have representatives that will come in and see us. If you can't come and see me, at least someone will come and see me on your behalf. And, and it's, part of, it's part of our system in that sense. One last thing, I, sometimes I have to admit that I was kind of a pain in the behind for some of these people, but, but they would be talking to me about this or that. And I would say, okay, I get where you're coming from. Now I need you to do me a favor. Tell me what the person who's going to come in who is opposed to what you're saying is going to mm-hmm. say. So, and they would say, well, we're not getting paid for that. And I said, well, I'm asking you, you're in my office. I want you to tell me what they're going to say. And that kind of threw them off a little bit, but that was part of the former professor and me too. And I wanted to make sure that they understood that I wanted to know all different sides of the issue on this thing. And if they, if they didn't want to tell me that, I'd say, well, I, I guess the meeting's going to be shorter than I thought. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but there's nothing you know, insidious about all this. And and the point about support, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, you've got support from a whole lot of different people and all the rest. You just have to make the, the best decision you can, uh, you know, from that. Well, I get the picture that uh, 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 both Linda and David um, think that this lobbying system is a pretty good thing, that this money in politics is working okay. Um, you know, lobbying is important and representatives of groups are very important. Why do you suppose that each year the exponential growth of money uh, into campaigns, why do you suppose they do that? Out of good government? They do it because they want you to, to vote their way, obviously. That's why, they, that's why they put money into television commercials. That's why they put money into the into social media. No, they want you to do their bidding, obviously. My point is that there's nothing wrong inherently with that process. Obviously, the money situation is getting out of hand. There's no question about that. But keep in mind, too, they can only contribute so much money to your campaign. It's not the money necessarily going to you and your campaign that matters, Steve. It's the money out there in the larger society. When now we're talking about Medicare, whether government should negotiate with drug companies for Medicare. And there's a ton of money out there on TV right now on both sides of that issue, as you can see. I think that's one of the big concerns more than anything else. So if, if you were to be funded primarily by oil interests, there shouldn't be any concern about your vote on climate, for instance. Oh, I would only guess that if you're supported by big oil, you're probably from Texas or Oklahoma. You're not, you know, you're not from Iowa where we have ethanol concerns and those kinds of things. I'd, kind of wonder about you if, you, if you're from Iowa and you got a lot, of, a lot of money from big oil, I probably would wonder about that. So they yeah, ran against one uh, in 1980. Dave, I wanna follow up on, on something that Linda said. She talked about the lively debate within the caucus. And, I, and I'm wondering, sometimes we look at you know issues and we say, well, the, the Democrats won't move a bit on this or the Republicans refuse to compromise. But do those respective positions sometimes uh, represent um, a lot of compromise within the Democratic caucus or within the Republican caucus to get to get you know from where 
you know, 200 and some members of uh, Congress or, or uh, you know, a similar, um, you know, a majority in the Iowa House, they have to each compromise a little bit to get to what becomes the caucus position? Yeah, I can't speak for the Republican Party, and, and I have been out now since January 3rd, uh, but, uh, you know, observing what I'm ser- observing right now, uh, and I do still talk to friends in the U.S. House, uh, it's, it's a difficult situation right now because, you know, basically both sides, the so-called moderates versus so-called progressives, they think they have the right idea about how to, how to move this, this country in the right direction. And complicating that is they, they both think they have the right idea as to how to make sure that Democrats maintain their majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. That's a big part of what's going into this debate right now. Uh, because I think that the so-called moderates, they believe that the smaller this Build Back America or Build America Better, whatever, Build Back Better package is, the, the less likely it is they can be attacked as being big government, big spenders and all the rest. Whereas the progressives, I think for the most part, believe that the bigger it is, the better because you know they might not be in the majority. Democrats might not be in the majority for much longer. They wanna make sure that they get programs, you know, new programs in that might last at least three to five years uh, and, and kind of get a foothold in that sense. So they're coming at it from kind of different perspectives. I think that within the Democratic caucus right now, I think almost everyone in that caucus agrees that that infrastructure bill, the bipartisan bill, should be passed. I think almost everyone agrees that, that some kind of Build Back Better program needs to be passed. It is now a question of, uh, which they didn't get, which they didn't actually figure out before this all went public. And that's where the rub is, sort of which programs do they want to see in it and for how long? And so that's really where the rub is at the moment. But generally speaking, you try to do the best you can to have a united front before you bring anything to the other side to try to compromise if you really need it. Uh, but that doesn't always happen, obviously. And right now, I think the mess that the Democrats find themselves in in the U.S. House is because uh, there are all these different factions and they didn't, they didn't do that before they brought this to the, to the public's view, if you will. Is it easier for a party to compromise when they haven't already compromised to get to the starting point? Um, I mean, when we have one party control, as we do now, both at the state and the federal level, do you think it, it's easier? Um, you, you, know, you, you uh, duke it out within the caucus to, to get to a position. And are you less likely to then compromise with the other party? Well, I think that's probably true. I mean, if you have enough votes to get it through, then you're not you're less likely, uh, Mm -hmm. whether you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, in control. Linda can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're less likely to negotiate very significantly with the other side if you think you can get it done on your own. And that's where if you think that's the case going in, then you darn well better have your your ducks lined up before you you take this thing to a vote. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And Linda, you may want to talk about Well, and I think you're right, Dave. That's certainly one aspect of it. The other aspect of that is that once the caucus has come together and had that, um, that, you know, compromise uh, done in the, within the caucus and with, with each other, then you move one piece and you start getting people kind of going in a different direction. And uh, so just mechanically compromises become more difficult. The thing I would say though, is that oftentimes, and this goes back to those relationships, oftentimes when when, um, you do have good relationships, which I will will tell you, we used to, and I think Steve, you alluded to that, uh, that uh, there were strong relationships in the legislature where where even members would bring even ideas that you know somebody in the, in the other party had for a bill and bring those and say why don't we include this and why don't we include that and 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 so the compromises would come from a lot of different places. Um, I think it's really gotten harder to do that with with uh, I think much 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 harder to have relationships with COVID and, and all of that. I think people, mm-hmm. elections, people don't get to know new people. And so you don't have that, but, but I'm kind of digressing from the question at hand. So I apologize for that. No problem. Um, so if, if the parties aren't willing to compromise, what effect does that have on the legislative body? If, if you know, we both uh, you know, go to our respective camps and say, that's it, 
we're, we're not coming out. Um, and what effect does that have on the legislative body and process? And, and what effect does it have on voters? If, if the voters are out there and saying like, Gridlock. Steve, you're, you're shaking, you're, you're nodding your head. Uh, <laughs> well, you're, you're describing the circumstance. And, and, and um, I think that's the, the real challenge today. Uh, uh, voters are not seeing a process that's responsive uh, to individual citizens. They see a process that... Uh, has gotten out of their hands, if you will, that uh, they see that, that uh, for instance, now the Republicans are in control in Iowa and they have marched lockstep in a number of areas that really are, I think, uh, questionable in terms of majority interest. Now, uh, for instance, uh, collective bargaining has been uh, pretty much uh, uh, retired. Uh, gun interests are advanced significantly. Uh, and uh, people who are witnessing this, and I think this is your question, uh, feel more and more that, you know, particularly under one party control, that, that uh, their voice isn't heard and they don't have much of a chance. I'm one who looks at this in the way that there's much reform that needs to happen in order for people to feel they're a part of it and people feel that their government is responsive to them and that they can reach compromise. Ending gerrymandering nationally is, of course, one of them. Now, fortunately, Iowa has a model law, but the Republicans have already denied one, they may deny the second, they may take it over. Uh, we have to allow more voting instead of restricting voting. One person, one vote assumes that, that everybody has a chance. We have to change the way elections are funded. We have to have things like automatic voter registration. We have to, uh, for instance, from my view, uh, make it illegal for lobbyists to make con uh, to uh, to make contributions, close the revolving door that sends members of Congress right into the lobbying business. And that's true in the legislature as well. So I think that's the only way we get back the confidence of citizens that what they are concerned about is, is really a, a reflected in representative government. That makes me think, uh, I've heard um, members of Congress say this, and it's, it's probably true at the legislative level as well, that sort of uh, making the argument that what you see on the news is, is not representative of what's going on in Congress, of what's going on in the legislature, that Dave Loebsack worked with Republicans, that Linda Upmeyer worked with Senator Reagan and, and Democrats, but maybe on those high profile issues, they're not working together. But day in and day out, uh, you know, Dave Loebsack was sponsoring legislation to increase broadband infrastructure or support some sort of farm programs that affected his district. So are, am, I the, am I the source of the problem here in the news media? Are we presenting sort of this picture of, of state and local government being dysfunctional, being in gridlock when that's not really the case? Um, I'll start with you, Dave. Well, uh, I tried not to be too nasty while I was in Congress two years ago, James. <laughs> I appreciate that. Now all bets are off. It is all your fault. But now, look, I mean, the old the old saying is, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, you know, media tend to uh, gravitate towards conflict, uh, and and so you know, when there's a fight, that's that's what gets covered. And as you said, you know, when we work together on things, we we fight like heck to try to get it known that we do. But you folks in the, the Gazette and the Register, uh, Iowa outlets were fairly good. You know, if 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 uh, if we had a bipartisan letter, for example, on biofuels, you know that that got covered. Um, we would push it hard, as you know. Please write about this because it's actually bipartisan and it's actually good for the state of Iowa and what have you. Um, but it is hard to break through, uh, especially now. Um, and and again. Uh, not to be terribly, terribly partisan about this, but especially in the age of Donald Trump, when you know conflict to the max was every single day, and that was what the media wanted to pay close attention to. 
breaking through all of that was so very difficult the last four years that I was in Congress. Um, but we tried the best we could. Sometimes we got through with that, sometimes we didn't. Uh, and I think now uh, it is more difficult to work together um, because of the way it has gone the last four, now five years uh, with, uh, with folks just sort of retreating to their respective quarters. There was for example, one, last, one, big, one important example. Recently, uh, a group of Republicans got together and wrote a letter to the president, to the administration about making sure that there's not a, a cutback in, in, uh, in the ethanol mandates and the and biodiesel mandates because based on rumors. Well, there were no Democrats on that letter. I have no idea why that was the case. I don't know if they didn't ask or what the deal was. But then a couple of days later, a bunch of Democrats got together, you know, Cindy Axley and others, to write essentially the same letter. Well, I, I, I'm not trying to say that it was all wonderful when I was there, but that was something that as a co-chair of the Biofuels Caucus, we worked our darndest to make sure we did together instead of the two different parties doing their things and then blaming each other for not working together or whatever the case may be. Um, but, but I think it does still happen more than most people know, but I can't say for sure just how much it happens at this point. When there, uh, oh, Linda, go ahead, please. Oh, I was just gonna, I was just gonna comment that, that I, I never saw uh, cameras in the chamber unless there was a big, big uh, controversial bill going to be debated. Mm -hmm. I think there is, there is some piece that it's, you know, I, and I get that it's not very, uh, it's hard to make it exciting when people are agreeing, right? That doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, I, I, I would note though, that I do think when, and I, I would speak to, for instance, editorial boards, when something is labeled right or wrong or villainized or, um, or elevated, I think then it's hard for people to move in a different direction. You've been labeled, you've already, um, you know, you've been uh, the idea, the individual, whatever, has already been sort of pigeonholed. I think it's really hard to move from that position or to get people to, to change their mind once, once that's happened. So I would say that that can be a real detriment. So Linda, I wanna go back to something you mentioned earlier and the effect of social media. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how much of a factor is this that um, if you, agree to a compromise, even a small compromise, you're, you're going to be called a rhino. You're going to be, you know, all sorts of names will be hurled your direction through social media. And, and Dave and, and Steve, I'm sure you're, you know, could, Steve, your, your service probably uh, was before <laughs> social media was such a factor, but um, how much impact does that have? The idea that, I mean, the fact that um, if you move an inch that almost immediately you're going to be pilloried on, on the social media platforms. Um, and while we, while we realize that social media isn't the real world, um, it, it has an impact. So, I mean, how much does that scare a legislator that uh, if they take an action, there's going to be an onslaught of, of uh, basically political name calling. Well, I think it's certainly intimidating uh, when you first experience it, for sure. And uh, so I, I, I suspect it uh, does have some effect, but I think it goes the other way too, when, when you offer, offer something that you believe is a compromise and you actually are, are criticized from both directions. <laughs> it's not enough, it's too much. It's you know you're kind of in a in a no win position. Uh, I so I rarely look at any of that uh, beyond my personal things I do, but uh, because I think you do get it from both ways, and it's a I think they people figure out quickly if they're going to pay any attention to it, it's going to be often a lose lose. So so I think it's difficult. For, for the people to navigate that. So you may, you're either one of the people that doesn't use it a whole lot, or you're one of the people that uses it fairly regularly and welcomes sort of the onslaught. And mm -hmm. you're energized by that, or you get information from it, whatever, uh, 
whatever the case may be. But um, but but you but you get it from both sides. It's not just one. Dave, I, I do. If you get it from both sides, you're probably doing the right thing. Uh, that's, right. That's, that's what a lot of people told me when I first went into office. And and look, you know, my district changed dramatically, and I'm going to talk about that tonight uh, in Iowa City at a, an event. You know, when I first got in, it was a D plus seven district. It was a very democratic district. By the time I left, it was an R plus four district. And and you know, I I basically did have to change some of my ideas about how to represent the people in my district as the district changed. And I didn't think that if I, I thought if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't be representing my district properly. And sure enough, I got into trouble, you know, with people on the left. And I, you know, I as a former educator, I didn't relish the idea that I had to educate people in Johnson County, that I had 23 other counties in my congressional district. And it wasn't just Johnson County. I didn't like going to the high V and hearing it from people who thought, you know, by God, you got to do what we're telling you here. But um, but that's the way it is. And, and you know, you just have to do the best you can to defend yourself when you're when you're being attacked like that. And, you know, there was a threat that I would be primary in any number of times. And, you know, that's just that's just life. That's how it is. And then you, you just keep going forward. And, uh, you know, I mean, you think about it, but you can't let that determine how you vote. Maybe I, I could add to it um, because I heard the word threat and, you know, there were threats of old and then there are the threats today. Um, and social media maybe of old, not too far back. And, but dealing with issues, uh, collaborating, uh, compromising, yet it seems like today, uh, it's about whether or not we believe in democracy, that there is a movement that I don't think we can ignore, that uh, uses all the levers of power and none of the levers of cooperation. And from school boards on up, uh, it's the loudest, it is the most threatening uh, that, that is uh, finding their way into the media, uh, maybe rightfully so, because it's a phenomena that probably needs to be covered. But I think we're entering a, a, an era where, number one, democracy is threatened. And number two, we've reached such a fever pitch that it, it that the threats of old about primary are giving way to the threats on life alone. I don't mean to be the, the, the object in the punch bowl here, but uh, I think we've entered a difficult time. Well, let me ask you this, um, Dave, and I think you sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, here in Iowa, we have a situation where one party controls uh, all the levers of government. In, in Washington, one party controls all the levers of government. Here in Iowa, Republicans ha have, you know, pretty much marched right through with their agenda. In, in Washington, Democrats are having a really tough time moving their agenda. What, what's the difference um, that, you know, uh, in one case, it, it's sort of just checking items off the agenda, uh, and, and yet in Washington, the party that controls everything is having such a tough time moving forward. Um, and Linda can correct me on this, but I, I think a lot of it has to do with diversity. Uh, within the state of Iowa, we, we have a lot of diversity within the state and within congressional districts. But I don't know how much diversity we have necessarily within state Senate or state, uh, state representative seats. I know we have some depending upon the, the seats, but, but the Democratic Party uh, in, 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 in America uh, and the Republican Party, but especially the Democratic Party, I think more so than the Republican Party, represents a, a lot of diversity around the country. You know, there's Barbara Lee from Oakland, California, and, and then there's Cindy Axney, you know, from, from Iowa. And when I was in, uh, and even, even more conservative, if you will, more Republican leaning district in the state of Iowa. Uh, that's why we don't have a parliamentary form of government here where we have cohesive 
parties. And I think sometimes arguments are, are made based on that kind of assumption, and it's a fallacy to do that. I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but but you know we have people from all over the country in these parties in the Congress, and they represent different interests. I would be enraged every year when a Massachusetts representative would introduce a resolution, a Democrat, introduce a resolution on the floor of the House and I'd fight like hell against it. We'd always defeat it. What, that was essentially designed to kill ethanol. You know, and, and I remember yelling and not saying very nice words to him afterwards. And uh, we had other instances where interests of a Democrat, you know, from Iowa were in conflict with interests of a Democrat from another part of the country. And that's really what we're seeing playing out. But I do believe that but that's that's that we're really tending in the direction now where the Democratic Party is becoming more unified ideologically and, and ethnically and otherwise and geographically. And so I, I think the days of that happening right now may very well be numbered. And I hate to see that because that's why some of my friends are retiring uh, next year and and not running for re-election. But it is the diversity issue, I think, as much as anything. A lot of different I add, and first of all, I, I can't imagine you saying bad words, David. <laughs> yeah, but not at all. Just... <laughs> In Congress. <David. laughs> but isn't it also numerical, really? Go ahead. Well, I, I was about to say that I think, uh, uh, David, wouldn't you say it's also about Numbers in Iowa, of course, the, the Republicans are, are a, set, a number of votes uh, ahead of the Democrats, whereas it's a very narrow margin exactly. in the Congress. And of course, then you've got the filibuster in the Senate, which really throws a monkey wrench into accomplishing something on the federal level uh, in addition to the numbers alone. Would you, would you buy that, David? Definitely. And then in the Senate, as you know, you you've got some diversity, at least you have two senators who you know, believe that their states demand that they not be moving in the same direction as the, as the progressives. And when you only have, when you have a 50-50 split and the vice president gets to you know, make the decision, two people can really throw a wrench into it. There's no question about that. Yeah. yeah. So we're coming up on the end of our session and I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about how we might make compromise more likely. And, and Dave, in Congress, there's the No Labels Caucus, and I think there are some other caucuses of similar nature that promote bipartisanship. Do they move the dial at all? Do they have an impact uh, on the debate and, and the outcomes? Yeah, I think they do right now. Again, to go back to, to Steve's point, that there are so few Democrat, the, the, the majority is so small that you know a group of nine or 10 No Labels folks can have some influence, there's no doubt. Now, they did extract the promises, you know, out of Nancy Pelosi to have a vote uh, by the end of September on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think the leadership was was really trying to work both sides on that. Uh, and and the, so there was a, a backtracking on that promise. Uh, but I think that that group, uh, you don't hear as much about them as you do about cinema and mansion. Mm -hmm. But I think, and they're not working exactly in tandem with those two folks. But they're working with them and they are, are having some effect on the size of the Build Back uh, a Better uh, package that may or may not ultimately uh, get passed. But if it does, it won't be as large and it may not have as many uh, programs in it uh, lasting for as long as the $3.5 trillion package does. So yeah, I think they are making a difference. Some don't like the difference they're making, others do. Linda, I, I don't think there's any similar caucus at the state house level, in, in a formal sense at least. Does that sort of discussion go on informally? And and how, you know, as a leader, as a speaker, how do you foster, I guess, what you call relationship building that leads to understanding and compromise between legislators and between parties? Well, I think there are certainly. Uh, probably we don't necessarily refer to them as caucuses, but I'm certainly aware during my time that there were sort of coalitions or factions of people that uh, surrounding an issue or um, um, uh, an approach perhaps to something that, that, you know, as soon as that number swells to something that can jeopardize passing a bill, of course, they have influence. So if it's if for the Iowa House, if it's nine members or 10 members, that makes a difference on whether or not a bill is going to pass. 
And so certainly then it, it can make a difference. I, you know, I go back to, I um, have a huge proponent of listening. And when you listen long enough and hard enough, you usually can find out something that you can find to agree on and uh, perhaps even understand where somebody's coming from that otherwise would you, you'd, you'd be scratching your head. And I, so I think if, if that, that's sort of the key, relationships, listening, finding people that um, are sort of like-minded on a topic and then approaching, uh, approaching whoever, whether it's the bill, the, the bill chair or the, or leadership or whoever it is that is making the decision on how something is going to move forward at that moment. Um, I, I think there's always an opportunity to work with them. And, um, and, and I think the way you approach it is, is key. I don't know very many people that, um, uh, when the conversation begins with expletives and name calling are going to be very receptive to uh, entertaining that, that, uh, that idea. Um, if you approach it by wanting to understand and seek understanding, then, then, then you might have an opportunity. And I think we've got to get back to that and, and, and to those relationships if we do want to want to understand. Because I think all the rest of it is sort of um, um, more symptoms, more um, more excuses, perhaps than than anything else. If we have a will to move things forward, and th- and that's what you're seeing is people have a will to move things forward, and I don't think that any ideas are frozen out and and uh, until they've kind of reached that path. I think there's all kinds of opportunity. We, we just have to seize that opportunity to have those conversations. May I say amen to, uh, do you have time for an amen? Yes. <laughs> and I want to ask you, how do we get people to sort of uh, be willing to compromise to take the first step? Um, sometimes it's, people seem to be afraid that they'll appear weak if they compromise or they might be taken advantage of. How, how do you encourage someone to take that first step? I think First for the like, amen, if I could, uh, I, yeah. I think it's important. Linda, you've said for the people in the room, you are so on point. My uh, training in mediation has pointed out lots of things about motivation in the room. But even more than solving the problem, is the opportunity to be heard. So your comment about listening uh, is so important. Um, And the other one you mentioned was understanding. People feel that a negotiation is successful if they've been listened to and understood. Because once that happens, they're actually gaining some strength to be able to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Uh, which is the, uh, uh, the first step, if you will, in, uh, in success of, uh, of any collaboration. And, and James, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I addressed directly your question. It was probably no, others. That's fine. And, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to, we're quickly running out of time. So I'm going to borrow another comment from the, the Onion Uh, which was attributed to another congressman saying, I've learned that digging in our heels accomplishes nothing but getting us everything we want. So I'm going to dig in my heels here and and say thanks for our panelists for sharing their time and perspectives on compromise and thank our audience for joining us.